turned up. Um, this is amazing. You know, we all turn up because of, of the value that is created through the conversations. And I want to start off by talking about a pitch where a pilot lost his job through COVID and then as a reaction to that, wanted to set up a regional airline here in the UK. And he's a first time founder and he's looking to raise 10 million pounds. And when I say this to some people, they're like, what? He's never going to raise 10 million on his first round. And then I talk to some people in the avia aviation industry and they go, only 10 million pounds? Because putting planes in the air is crazy expensive. So this founder found me on LinkedIn. He'd never mentioned anything on my comments. He'd never spoken to me directly. And then he appeared in my DMs and was like, hey, I love what you do. <clears throat> Show me how we could make a pitch deck together. So we made that pitch deck and we followed the conventional wisdom. And we had the 14 slides, the 12 slides. We covered all the key points that you're supposed to. We shared it to his advisors. We got their input. We iterated <clears throat> and we got a pitch deck that everyone was super happy with. Spoiler alert, he never used it. The pitch deck got used, but didn't actually start the investment. He's very close to raising his first million, but he didn't use the pitch deck that we created to do that. But what he did tell me was that by going through the process to create the pitch deck, he was ready to pitch in any situation. And that's what this is all about today. It's about your pitch strategy, because whatever you think is going to happen, doesn't. And what he actually did, his girlfriend gave him a book, an entrepreneurial book. In the book, there was a chapter that referenced a, a sort of big investor. He used the cold call email structure that we developed. He cold called, he cold emailed the investor. He got a green light. He got a four minute phone call. On that four minute phone call, he was able to answer the questions convincingly with authenticity and conviction to get him the phone call with the bigger meeting to set up the raise discussion. But he didn't use the slides we created. And I'm a pitch coach and I'm always telling you, you need slides. But now I'm asking the question, do you? You need a pitch strategy. Ollie. No, no I'm just saying goodbye, Peter. Oh, okay. So you need a pitch strategy. Now we have a process for creating our slides and we go through an eight step process from whiteboard through to spotlight moment. And this is our roadmap strategy. And what I really see every day is that you need to be flexible. Because once you get that first bit of investment, so this airline founder, is very close to getting that first million pounds and he's got the domino set up. So when the first one falls, other people are gonna get on board because somebody else has shown belief and conviction. But like I said, it didn't come from the 12 slides that we created for him. And so like Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face and they get KO'd. And we see so much sort of information and advice and lecturing on social media you need this to be this you need this to do this you need this to do this do you you need to listen and you need to have a plan but you need to duck the punches and know and see when they're coming and it's more about a pitch strategy than saying i've got my 12 slides now i'm going to go and reach the right investors now, I learned this big time, painfully, when I was doing a TEDx Beijing talk in 2010. And I had a plan of how it was gonna go. I created a very complex pitch. I was on stage for 18 minutes. I'd never spoken to 100 people before. And this is how I felt. I was a spinning top. I was physically moving in nervous and anxious circles. My voice was going all over the place. The complex script that I'd written was starting to fall over because I had overcomplicated things and my plan was rigid. It could only work one way and I had no flexibility to manage the situation. So it comes back and you'll see this a few times to this pitch strategy. What tools do I need to set a course, have a destination, but be able to course correct on the way? 
because often those 12, 14, 15, 20 slides you're going to create in your pitch deck won't actually make the difference. Now I want to talk about how the transformation from caterpillar to butterfly unpacks. Now, I believe it goes along a process like this. Seven steps. Your pitch, first of all, needs to catch attention and it needs to end up with ambassadors. Now, this is a seven step process, but there might be a five step process, a six step process. Everyone has their own sort of map of how we go from, I don't know about something, this idea is a caterpillar to how, wow, look at that beautiful butterfly fly. And I'm gonna be telling and showing other people. So this is the seven step process that I've mapped out. But then you've got to get past the gatekeepers. The people intentionally whose only role is to stop information getting into the organization, the goalkeeper of the team. And having worked with Volkswagen in China, Mercedes, Google, BMW, Audi, Nike, there are so many gatekeepers. And every pitch is about convincing the gatekeeper to let it pass. So you need to be flexible because if you go in with one plan and they say no, which they do by default, you need to be flexible to come back and think, how am I going to get around this situation? Now, what are the steps? Some people have five, seven, ten. I'm not saying there is a specific set or my formula is different or better than somebody else's. What I'm saying is that expect the steps and then you can have flexibility in how you pitch. So I'm going to share a picture of my daughter when she cut her teeth. This was a couple of years ago. This is one of the crocodiles that I have to wrestle. And so how did I cut my teeth in pitching? Just so you know a little bit more about me. So I started off in the UK. I graduated from graphic design in, nine, in 2000. Spent four years working in museum game design. 2004, I went to China, supposedly for two years. Came back in 2019. We've been in the country since because of COVID, and now I'm reinventing what I'm doing and really talking to startups here in the UK. But I've worked in teaching, uh, events, art, graphics, corporate, film, and all in presenting and pitching ideas. These are some of the companies that we've worked with from CEO level right down to sort of project by project, day to day work. Everybody presents as well as startups, founders, entrepreneurs, accelerators, demo days, communities. We're all here pitching and presenting. So please get in touch with me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm the only crocodile wrestler that will teach you how to pitch. There are probably other crocodile wrestlers that will teach you how to wrestle crocodiles, but that's too dangerous. So pitch strategy, what's it all about? So another example of why you need one is if you use templates in the wrong way, everything starts looking the same. And I know this from a personal uh, first-hand example. When I was working in an agency, we sent out an RFP for a website. We got in the proposals. My job was to show them to the leadership who would then make a decision on who to work with. I remember going through one pitch deck and by the third slide, the two decision makers turned to each other and said, why are we looking at a template? Why are we looking at the same thing that everybody else looks at? Why aren't we looking at our problem being solved with ideas about us? And I was there pressing space bar, advancing through the slides going, no one's even reading this. All of the work that went into this, whether it was a day or two weeks, is totally wasted because the audience can't see themselves in the solution. And that is part of being flexible. So it all comes down to audience and goals. Who are you speaking to? And what are your personal motives for being in front of them? So I was, as I was putting these slides together last night, I was thinking, why am I going to talk to the community? What do I want to share? What do I want to get out of it? How do I want to be remembered afterwards? That influenced the stories I selected to share with you today. I was also thinking, who are you? From what I know from the community and joining the community surgery every week, interested, diverse communities of people sharing ideas and problem solving. So I wanted to share back to you some theories and some ideas that you can think about and not say that is the exact jigsaw piece that I'm going to use, but this is an idea I can use to solve my future problems. Now, another massive reason we need to be flexible with our pitch strategy is from 
And so a massive example of this is when my friend who's setting up the airline went to go and pitch, had his slides ready, but the person that could say yes to giving him a million pounds didn't want to see slides, completely owned the moment and just hit him with four minutes of rapid fire questions. So when you have frame control, the people that are your audience often have the bigger frame and the heavier leverage. So we need to be flexible with our pitch to sort of say, oh, I was going to share 12 slides, but you know what? I'll just talk to you for 30 seconds, ask you if you have a question. Now that 30 seconds of pitch becomes so much easier when you have made the slides. The process gets you to the moment of being ready, of being flexible. We're not rigid. We're like some nanotechnology that can be incredibly strong and resilient, but also flex to its pressures and its environment. And that's how I want you to be when you pitch next. Another great thing about having a, a super good pitch strategy is the ability to see high level and super granular. And I think that was kind of illustrated in the second half of today's strategy session where Matt asked a question and he got ideas from all over the place. Some things he knew and some things, oh, maybe I hadn't thought about. So it's that perspective of being able to look across to the horizon and see where we want to go and enjoy the view but then coming down and seeing the granular nitty gritty elements that put it all together. Now, whenever I'm thinking about sharing advice or reading advice or looking for insights, to me, it's all about, well, you're really just looking through a keyhole. The content, the context and the specificity of it is super important. But most of the time advice comes through this tiny lens of a keyhole that makes perfect sense for the LinkedIn post, but actually, really isn't that valuable until it's contextualized with specific details. So again, it's this broader strategic idea. And to me, a lot of advice and a lot of templates are a cake tin. The cake tin doesn't make the cake. The chef, the ingredients, following the recipe, the flair, the passion, the ambition, that makes a difference between a near yeah, average cake and a, ooh, a summer fair winning showstopper that your auntie made that's absolutely delicious because she cares about every single moment. It's not about just plopping the ingredients in the tin. And a pitch deck, its templates, its slides, its formulas are the cake tin. Now you need the cake tin because otherwise it just dribbles all over the bottom of the oven doesn't turn into a cake it turns into a mess you have to clear up the cake tin is not the thing that's going to get you the investment because investors look at lots of cake tins and the first thing they'll do is brush them aside and whether you're even talking to your co-founders your team your media other experts people see a lot of cake tins and so it's not about coming in and saying look how polished my cake tin is it's about saying hey do you want a slice of this cake so being flexible. Now we're coming up to the end. So I've got one more analogy before we have a final story. And then I would love to flip this into a conversation where you guys can tell me your experiences with having pitches where it's maybe been too rigid or it's been really flexible. And that would be a great discussion. So the way I th would like people to think about their pitch deck is like a DJ. That could be a wedding DJ, it could be a stadium filling DJ, it could be an underground DJ. Every single DJ has a shelf full of records and they collect records. In the afternoon of their gig, they go through their records, they listen to a couple, they put a selection in a bag. Then they go to the venue, they watch the crowd, they look at the atmosphere and they tell a musical story. They might play two thirds of the records they take with them, but they are hand selecting the songs they want to play in that moment. And I want you to do that with your pitch. You have a record shelf full of ideas. You don't have to play them all. You have to read the audience, read the atmosphere and make a really strong connection. And too many people turn up with a mixtape, stick it on and press play thinking that's going to build the right atmosphere that they will have in a moment when they have attention. So don't take your mixtape to your events because people can see it a mile off and they switch off. 
So the final story that I want to share is earlier at the beginning of this year, a founder reached out to me on LinkedIn and he said, I've got to go to a B2B event. Now he makes cocktails, ready-made cocktails. They're beautiful, brands amazing. He's done it as a side hustle. He's just transitioned full time. He's in retail. He's got traction. He's on a beautiful founder journey curve. And he came to me and he said, well, I'm going to a B2B event. And before COVID, I would have had a booth. People would have been milling around and I would have been talking to people just like any other trade show. Now, because of COVID, we have a list of targets. We have pre-arranged conversations and I have 13, 20 minute conversations in one day. They're coming into my booth and I've got people like the Radisson, the Hilton, Eurostar, Yosushi, Centre Parks. All of these big companies are coming in to see how we can work together. Brilliant. So I started by saying, well, we need a strategy because these guys are buyers. They do this all day. If you go in and give them the standard pitch, they're going to switch off. And if they see the same pitch that everyone else sees, they're going to switch off because the Radisson's goals are very different than Yosushi's. Different budget, different spend, different expanse, different retail, different opportunities. So if you have the same pitch again and again and again, it's going to fail. So we created 13 different, steps, 13 different conversations, 13 different visuals where the client saw themselves on the first slide and saw themselves throughout the whole six deck pitch. He didn't use any of them. They turned his glass upside down and they said, we're not going to look at your content. We're going to own this moment because we're here. We're doing this all day. I've got the money. You listen to me. So they completely frame controlled him and he didn't miss a beat. Even though he had spent money and time creating this pitch deck strategy, he didn't get to share it until <clears throat> after the event. After the event, the next morning, he was sending out PDFs that he had up his sleeve, but he was flexible enough to know, you know what, right now, if I force this, I'm going to send them running. So I've got to be in their frame right now. And he said that going through the pitch deck creation process allowed him to be like Neo in the matrix, deal with the questions and have flow so that he was present in the moment with the people that could change the trajectory of his business without going, I need to send you my deck. I need to show you my deck. I made the deck. Oh my gosh. So the final thing I will share is that a great takeaway is that when you're working on your pitch, don't work for the perfect pitch. Pitch in the windows of time that you're given. And they can be generally broken down to someone's going to give you eight seconds and they want, kind of want you to stop after 30 seconds. They might give you a slightly longer window where you get three minutes, then you might get five minutes. Now you have to be flexible in each of these situations and tell the stories that are gonna resonate and move the conversation forward. And we started with a quote from Mike Tyson. We're gonna finish with a quote from Bruce Lee. <clears throat> be like water, my friend, and you will find the way to connect with your audience. Now, this is an amazing community. I'd like to introduce you to an additional amazing community, which is called Pitch Club. Happens at these times every single week. And if you wanna come and work on your pitch, work on a structure, work on an opening, work on the product reveal, please come and join us at Pitch Club. An amazing community just like this one full of people that really care. And we have one spot open for tomorrow evening's pitch. So if you're working on something, you wanna jump in, let me know. And this was me. And thank you very much, guys. And now I'd love to hear your thoughts, hear your stories, and see how this has been part of your journey. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. That was uh, awesome. I know a lot of you have uh, done, I have pitched before or preparing pitches. So whilst we've got Martin in the room, is there any questions you would like to ask? It's a very good opportunity to do so now. Tim. Hi, Martin. Excellent. Uh, I was going to say presentation. It was, it was excellent communication. Very, 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 uh, very sophisticated. I'm sure you know what I mean by that. It's, and it's meant as a compliment. 
I I absolutely agree with you. It's getting what you want to get across completely embedded in your head and creating presentations and refining them and testing them is a, a process that uh, I've used a lot. What I've found, I'm agreeing with you, is once you've done it enough, then you don't actually need the presentation, but you need the process of having created it and become very familiar with it and thought through all of the objections and all of the all of those sorts of things. So I think I'm agreeing with what Martin said, that um, the process is really, really important. Fantastic. So, I mean, it's like what they said about David Beckham, first to arrive, last to leave, and all he would do is kick the football. And that allows him to be epic in those few seconds when it really, really matters. Um, and it's and it's exactly the same thing. So I'm glad. Have you got any direct stories of how you've maybe been underprepared or overprepared? Or I mean, I've been doing these for, for I think the first what you call presentation I can remember doing. I was 31. I'm 58 now, so I've done. I'm not exaggerating thousands. So. Um, I've had disasters with IT um, going wrong part of the way through a presentation. I've had uh, you you get you you pitch it literally. You you got the content created for a particular type of audience, and you find that the audience is there, which you could probably predict if you thought about it more. It's completely missed the beat. I've had those sorts of things where people just say it's not relevant. Um, but once you, my own, with all of that experience and certain pitches, you know, we're, we're selling what we do, the, the, you know, I've done it so many times that I don't need the content. I've got the stories prepared. The, the structure of how I'm going to speak is in my mind, I, I'm, I, but I can also uh, pivot if I need to, but you, you, that, that the thing I've, taken away is this frame control you can actually control the frame because there's no they, they can't see a deck they can't yeah. they don't know that you're, you're talking from a script you might be it just comes across much more naturally because there's no visual aid there you, it sounds like it is off completely off the cuff conversation you're telling a few personal anecdotes that reference a few things as you did and it becomes much more like a conversation. Mm -hmm. And often you put it in a situation where they work best is where the other party doesn't realize it's a sales pitch. Yeah. So that's the other thing is to try and frame it such that you're in a situation where, you know, I've had people buy without even realizing what's been done to them, which is obviously uh, gratifying because, yeah, that. They, they heard a story which they weren't expecting and it obviously uh, pushed the right buttons. Absolutely. But it takes a lot of preparation to get there. You're right. Absolutely right. Excellent. Cheers, Tim. Ollie, do you want to moderate or shall I? No, just... no, I think that was uh, very good. We got a question uh, from Francesca, then Gareth and Karishma. Did you want to raise a question or? No, that's fine. Um, hi there. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say that was uh, really interesting, um, just about the whole kind of flexibility uh, part of it, because when I've been doing pitches in the past, it's been, um, you know, there's always had to be a structure, there's always had to be a formula, and I think having that flexibility is really useful. Um, I actually did, a, well, not quite a pitch, but I did a talk at um, Hull University Business School, and actually we did it for about an hour. And we didn't have a script at all, myself and my business partner. We're quite used to speaking together. So we just sort of went into it um, and it actually worked really well because I think what we communicated to the students was that kind of authenticity rather than um, rather than going in there saying, oh, we want to lecture you about this, this, this and this. Actually, it was far more, um, you know, there was that kind of malleability to it. So I would like, I, I genuinely like uh, appreciate that because I think Oftentimes in business, it is it is more about structure and more about formula and less about um, 
authenticity. Um, so the question I'd actually like to raise was, um, I have a pitch, quite an important pitch actually, uh, not next week, but the week after. Um, and we, we actually found, so we, we have kind of like a structure of a pitch. So we have a script that we tend to use sort of a, a rough introduction, a rough uh, ending. Um, but we were on a call um, and we did the pitch to, um, we were being mentored by a, a guy at Apple at the time. Um, and it was us and another person on the call. Um, and we thought we, we did okay because we've often done the, the pitch before. So we thought we were quite confident with that we did it. And then this other guy came on um, and this guy, I don't know what it was, but he sounded so much more enthusiastic. And I was thinking, why is that? And I, and I thought, you know what? The script is threadbare. Like we've, used, we've overused this script at this point because we, we were so used to that formula because we've been doing it for months, um, probably since about September, I guess it had been in use. So I guess um, what I'd like to ask is when, when do you know that you need to change um, the way that you're doing things? When do you, when do you know? Because I mean, I guess with, with me, it was sort of, it hit that point where I was like, oh wait, we, we need to change things a bit. We need to make this a little bit more original. So um, when, when was that for you? And, and when did you start to kind of feel like, you know, we need a bit more flexibility here? That's great. Um, thank you very much, Francesca. Um, you, <clears throat> basically my approach, and when I, when I got into presentations, I made a really binary decision that everything was gonna be a presentation. However, I communicated, whether it was one slide, 10 slides, 100 slides, 300 slides, whatever it was always because that's what I do. And after watching from the sideline, the massive disconnect between uh, audiences and um, presenters and just seeing how it literally just like, like a slow motion car crash. And also I use the DJ analogy because I was when I was in Beijing, I was a VJ. And so I would play the visuals um, in the clubs and I'd be right stood next to international DJs, household names, as well as my mates who DJed. And I watched their preparation and that was a massive influence. And I think, so basically what I do is I will reshuffle my deck every single time before I go into, into a session. Whether it's just resequencing one or two that I think was a bit clunky or thinking about my audience and saying, well, actually, that's really not important for them so I can skip over. And so I'll, I'll just like a deck of cards, reshuffle it and then lay it out. And what that does is by reshuffling it, it keeps me on my toes because I sort of don't know what's coming next. But as soon as I see the visual, it unlocks the story that I want to tell of that slide. And if you look at my slides, um, no words, pretty much. Every picture just goes click. And so I see that and I know what I want to say. And so that's a really good way of doing it, because if you sort of turn up and you play the same song, you're like, I don't know, Radiohead, and they, they can't play any of their first two albums because they're so overplayed and they just hate them. And so I would say, like, give yourself some very simple rules that's not going to trip you over but it's going to keep you on your toes because that then projects to your audience and they're like, wow, this was great. And if you just make, it's a bit like getting um, clothes tailor-made. You go in for the measurements, you go in for a first fitting, you go in for the final one and they're literally changing millimeters, but that's what makes you feel super special because you're like, oh yeah, this is hundred percent for me. Ooh. So really like take your core scripts and shuffle 20%. So that you know that if there's any wobbles, you're not gonna you know, drive into a wall, but you're also like, this is, I'm not sure what's next. And, and the audience, and, I've, and I know that I've put in some cherries for that particular audience. And I can share from my website, I have a list, 20 discovery questions, 10 for your audience and 10 for you as the presenter saying, why are you doing this? And if you just answer three or four of those questions each time, it will help you reshuffle without rebuilding. Um, and I can send that link and it's, you know, you don't need to sign up for an email or anything like that. It's just download the PDF. Um, and I would, yeah, just finish by saying, set yourself a mini challenge because the rewards will be what you experience from the other person's passion and energy that will give you this. So you're not just turning up and playing the same song again, like, because you know that it doesn't work. You're feeling it. So so just 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 spice it up, throw in an extra image, do something a little bit 
unconventional and that will that will really help thank you very much francesca yeah, thank you. um we've got gareth warren and in henry if that's okay martin absolutely yeah uh great awesome um martin a uh, few things um firstly great use of the uh, obs and green screen on your uh, presentation i love seeing a uh, floating head in front of powerpoint rather than just powerpoint so much more engaging so um great work um and really great presentation covered um so much value as as expected um i've sat on both sides of the fence on this one i've, I've been a pitcher and, a, and i'm regularly a pitchy um both in a personal capacity as investor and also um as part of the henley business angel syndicate um and I, was, I see a lot of pitches and I get um, maybe a little um, jaded, for want of a better phrase, by some of the um, lack of differentiation amongst a lot of them, the sort of homogenization of the pitch deck. And, and that's typically because people are often following a given model or whatever, um, and um, they're not, not giving enough thought to what specifically about their um value proposition and team they want to emphasize so um i would say that i've learned as an investor to look at the pitch as part of a bigger um package rather than make decisions purely on a deck um and i i know most of the seasoned investors that i invest alongside don't make their decisions purely on a deck what the deck does for the pitcher is, is keep you anchored, keep, make sure you're covering your salient points and make sure that you're setting up a follow on conversation. Um, and also giving you enough understanding and awareness and, and comfort with your value proposition that when someone does reframe you, you can just pivot and you can be so flexible and you can um, answer the questions go into sort of unstructured mode, if you like, um, rather than delivery mode. Um, so I, I find they're useful for that. As a pitchy, um, I, I kind of look for four things. It seems like, can I trust the team? Am I excited by the value proposition and the opportunity in front of me enough? Um, is there a likely possibility for return on my investment at some point without necessarily locking down when? And do I want to have a further conversation and, and all of the investment decisions kind of get done thereafter? You know, you, 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 deep, you dive deeper, you have proper due diligence conversations, the pitch deck is to whet the appetite. Um, so there is a way back. Don't set so much pressure on yourself that um, this is the make or break moment. It's part of the overall journey. Um, and if you fluff it, you know, you can still probably save it and turn it into a conversation in a less pressurized environment um, if you if you do so gracefully. Um, but so it's, it's important to have, but it's not so important that you have to bet your life on it. Probably my two pennies. That's perfect. That's an amazing two pennies, Gareth. It is you like you've seen a lot of cake tins, haven't you? And you're just like, oh god. And the thing is, if you don't use, if you don't use the cake tin, the investors go, but something's missing because I'm expecting to see something. So the cake tin is super important, but it's what you put in the cake tin that makes the massive difference. And are you serving a a sort of a tapas style conversation starter, or are you delivering the whole cake? You know, and and I think like what you've explained and shared is is so valuable because it is those four criteria that you will check off to get to the conversation where you're going to dig down into the business. It's not the pitch deck that's going to sort of convince you. It's not like an arm wrestling match, is it, where you're trying to like slam someone down? So awesome, thank no, you. And, and as you say, on the cake tin front, you know, even to the point that I can probably tell whose cake tin they're using. Like, oh, yeah, that's Jamie Harford's or that's Pratik Sanjay's or I, I can see what you've done there. You've structured it in exactly the paint by numbers that um, someone has told you to do with this template. And I don't want a boxed off the shelf supermarket cake that's come off a production line. I want a cake where the ingredients like hit me in the palate um, and uh, maybe I don't know the etymology of it. I don't know the provenance, but I want to find out. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Great. I, love, I hadn't thought about the supermarket off the shelf cake. That's, I'm going to add that in. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Martin. We're, we're picking up as we go through from our great audience. And uh, up next, Warren and then Henry. Uh, re uh, thank you, uh, Martin. It's really, really good. Well, I'd like to, um, <clears throat> I think probably all of us here have done a lot of presenting over, over the years. Um, one of the things that is really, really important for me is the art of storytelling. So it'd be really good to get your take on 
the relationship or the disconnect between like a pitch deck and the art of storytelling and how that, you know, learning that art of storytelling, you know, underpins everything that you're doing. So if you if your deck goes up in the air, you've still got the story and the story arc. And and when you're coaching and mentoring people, whether you, what you do and what courses or whatever, it'd be really interesting to hear that side of stuff from you. Yeah, great. Thank you, um, Warren. I think story is a really um, delicate word because it's about to turn into the biggest, well, it is the biggest buzzword in social media right now. It's like, tell a story, be a storyteller, story, 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 story. Um, and I think there's uh, Brene Brown, the TED, TED speaker, has an amazing quote. I don't know if you've heard of it, but like, um, uh, what a story is it? Uh, data is a story with data is a story with soul. Hmm. I don't know if you've heard that. I might have mispronounced, misquoted that. Um, and so it's like, wh why I love that quote is because you can sort of put up a statistic, and we had that in the conversation uh, in the first surgery hour about the difference between convincing people with decisions on statistics or emotions. And like every piece of data has been created by somebody wanting to do something, a swipe, a tap, a search, a location, a purchase, a rejection, a comment, uh, whatever, review. Now, if you can unravel why that person did that thing, there's your story. And it always comes down to people. And I think also like, what is the transformation that someone goes through? Because sometimes people say, I'm gonna tell you a story and really they give you a list. And they just put the story as the highlighted title and it's kind of like, well, it's not really a story, but then you're getting into academics and, and you know, like levels of detail that I don't think you need to get into so much. I think it's more a case of how can you share something that's going to be interesting and start the story rolling in that person's head by just literally getting two stones and smacking them together to get that spark to start the fire. And don't overcomplicate the story. Don't worry about, am I a good storyteller? Just go in with passion and excitement and have a structure that's a little bit, has something delightfully unexpected, but logical, and then leads to the audience making the conclusion you want them to make for themselves. Um, and so I used what I call the three beat mountain. And it's, based on the three act play. So I read the hero's journey and um, all the classic storytelling books. And then I simplified it. I've got it on my website. I will share a link to it. And it's a framework that is um, very flexible because I'm all about flexibility um, and just allows you to sort of plot out ideas that aren't caked in and are more like, listening to a great chef talk about their recipe because they add in the anecdotes and the elements and the specificity that makes it interesting and give it texture so to, to sum it up it's like story is a huge buzzword it's incredibly valuable but i think as long as you're entertaining and you're you, you're talking to people as if you were in a social situation then you're more more human and more emotional and then the stories will come. But it's not a case of like, I have to tell this sort of epic, wise story that kind of gets banded around so much. So, I mean, that's a bit of a long-winded explanation. I hope that sort of shares my perspective on your, your question. Yeah, it's brilliant. Thank you, Martin. So some of the things that I think are really important is you, you kind of touched on there is the empathy element of it is, is hugely important. Um, trying to put either whoever you're presenting to whether it's one to one one to few one to many is 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 having them as the main character trying to trying to frame them as as that as that main main character is is, is really important as well um and that you know the 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 three peaks thing is really really good but also the the art you know the 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 expert in the experts in this area is disney right and they do a lot of um disney books on the, the the storytelling which i often point um a lot of people that i'm coaching and mentoring to do these things well in in certainly in public public sector or corporate environments to be able to make sure that they can because you want to get you want to 
get to the end point, which is your goal, your objective. And always remember that in mind and make sure you've got that, that, um, that narrative to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just on the Disney thing, my kids are four and a half. They're watching a lot of Disney. And every time they start a movie, you get that Disney castle animation where they, and so my kids are like, this is a story. I'm in the Disney universe. I'm being led down the Disney path. And that's what I feel when people in a pitch go, let me tell you a story. I imagine I see the Disney castle. I'm like, here we go, story time. The alternative is to, to start like Pulp Fiction and just crash cut into a sentence between two people, four and a half minutes later, they're robbing a diner. Yeah. And then you're bang into another bit, bang. And so I'm like either pitch like Disney or pitch like Tarantino, but be intentional and have like you can follow the recipe or you can chop the recipe up oh. like you said audience and goals what are you trying to achieve thanks martin yeah, thanks cheers. very much warren um last question from henry yeah uh, thank you Martin. That, 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 that was really insightful and, and very useful and i think you know so much of what you said is is just I suppose reinforcing uh, uh, my approach. I mean, I, I, I should explain. I mean, I run my own business, but I am a salesman. That's my job. I'm a salesman. You know, um, that that's where I trained. I was selling media, amongst other things. And and I think that that, that what's what's really fascinating is, you know, during all of the sales training I've ever had, it's always been about let's have a structure. And the reason why we would have a structure is so that we can be adept and we can move and move like water, as you say, um, and, and we would understand where we are within that sales process. And so whether you've got a pitch deck next to you or not, you know where you are within the cell and you've got a structure to fall back on. And I think that that's really useful. Um, and I, I, you know, I mean, it's a bit old hat now, but, you know, I do talk to my colleagues about uh, Dipida and Ada as sales structures, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, I suppose that the, the, the problem I, I would raise is that I think that so often now within the pitch process, we have to, before we get to that point where we're standing in front of somebody, before we get to that point where we can be fluid, we're having to submit documentation, we're having to send through an RFP, um, we're having to, or, or a response to an RFP, um, we're, we're having to send through a deck which presents our business or uh, uh, a list of solutions. And, and we don't get the ability to have the flexibility. You know, if I'm standing up in front of somebody, great, I can, I can do that, you know? But if I'm communicating with them online and that initial communication has come to me and probably seven other agencies as well, um, and I know I am one of many who is responding, what is your best tip to get stand out at that stage? Oh, that's a good one. Oh. <laughs> Cheers. Um, I mean, it brings me back to the sort of caterpillar butterfly transformation. And like, if you have, I don't know if you've read the Wolf of Wall Street's book uh, that he's written about sales and his, his sort of 10 step pipeline of how he goes from no to yes. And, and all the, I mean, I, I was told to read that book and, he, and they said, don't think about what you feel about the main protagonist of the story. Just what can you learn from him? And what, how do you get that attention? And how does that attention become, you know, understanding and, and all of those things? And I think it's probably consistency, just turning up. And like, like the sort of cliches on social media, give, 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 show value, do this, do that. It's like everybody that I've worked with that's given me money has never, ever turned up in my visible social media presence they've never liked anything they've never dropped a comment they've they've been they've been the people at the back of the club with their arms crossed in the shadows just bobbing their heads as i'm the dj the people at the front raving are just other people that want attention from other people it's the people at the back of the room silently listening who are the ones that are going to step forward and say let's do this and the thing is, you don't know who they are or where they are. And with social media, they call it lurking, which I think is a horrible word, but it's they are being intentionally discreet. Because if they walked around saying, any coaches available for pitch correct, they'd, they'd be at the bottom of a rugby scrum, absolutely squashed. So I think it's the case of consistently turning up and dialing through, I'll show you I'm an expert, I'll show you I've messed up, 
I'll show you I understand you and just constantly scrolling through that playlist and being unique and different in each time and we're so in the time when we don't have any informational value or advantage like I say the same thing as every other pitch coach and it comes down to do you want to work with the ex-trial lawyer the the stand-up comedian the ex-graphic designer the ex-financial guy or the ex um you know Every, those are all real pitch coaches that I know and who's going to like whoever wants to work with Martin wants the graphic design experience the visual storytelling the sketching the China experience the agency experience if you want to work with Robbie you want the guy that's done 101 trial case you know being a lawyer and so I think it's like be consistent be interesting and then people will choose to work with you when they're ready and I know that's a very sort of like um there's one guy on linkedin i don't know if you follow josh braun sorry how do i spell the surname uh, braun b-r-a-u-n okay he is a machine i blink and he's got five more posts up video sliders text well i'm 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 illustrating one of his books at the moment um, and his perspective on sales is is like should be a life lesson, and um, mm. it, it's just incredible. And he actually was head of sales at Basecamp, which I think was a uh, somebody mentioned that in the first hour of the session as as a software. So he was selling Basecamp for a long time, and now he teaches sales. And interesting. I'm interesting. I know Basecamp very well, but yeah, okay, yeah, I didn't I didn't recognize the name. I, he, I think he was he was the guy that was in you know the sales room clicking up the numbers but if you you follow him on linkedin um incredible incredible insights so i feel to answer your question i'm just echoing him and he has way more like sales attention grabbing he, he uses an expression poke the bear um and we're currently illustrating a book together called snake struggling with holes and it's all about sales uh sales blunders that people make um and so yeah check those out on linkedin um interesting okay yeah i will do yeah 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 um okay and i will read um uh the wolf of wall street book as well yeah i think that, that would be interesting i watched the film a great film i probably shouldn't have watched it with my mum that was a mistake but um there you go anyway thank you very much yes henry thanks uh Martin, thanks Henry for the good question there. Um, have we got time for one more? Because I think Tim's got his hand up there. You you got an additional question, Tim? It's not really a question. It was just an observation on Henry's problem. Really, is that yeah, the best way to stand out when you get an RFP is to have made the sale before it comes to the door. I don't know whether Henry's out there hunting. Um. That was what I would recommend. I mean, you obviously got to get everything looking great. And but the best way to understand what the client wants is to have done a pre-sale before they start the sales process, which yeah. is, a whole, is a whole different thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, if you can get that opportunity beforehand, great. You know, um, sometimes that's possible, sometimes it's not. No, yeah. that, that's, that's great, thank you. I mean, just on that note, when I was in uh, China, there was a big agency, one of the big global ad agencies was pitching for like a bottled water account. And we created the pitch deck for them. They had 300 slides. It was a four hour multi-person strategical walkthrough. Um, and then another agency won because they were cheaper in the, in the budget. And, and like the people sat in the meeting didn't get the final decision on who they would work with. That was all down to the, the hidden purchasing department. So it's like, it, at some point, like you said, you sell it before, win it before you go in. But at the same time, you are just sometimes a horse running in a race that, you know, you are so not going to win. Um, and that's why I think just consistently showing up and sharing that you know what you're doing is a way to sort of uh, win before you begin, in a sense. People have made that choice before they even talk to you that they, because everyone who reaches out to me on LinkedIn pretty much says yes, um, because they've made the choice, the price is what they can afford, and then they go for it. Um, and it's because they've committed beforehand, I think, in their minds. But One, one final thing from me, 
um, Martin, is we have come across a lot of um, pitch coaches during the, the, the course of start to stand up. Um, and one thing that you, you are different and sets you apart is your passion and enthusiasm. And it doesn't matter what you do, how good your pitch is, and if we follow everything you've said today, if you've got, haven't got that point of interest, that, that passion and enthusiasm for your product, don't expect anyone else to have it. So this is, this is why we, we had the opportunity recently, Martin, um, with the uh, Brazilian founders, you was our, our first go-to person because we knew you, you would come along and, and um, compliment what we're doing here at uh, Start to Stand Up. So I wanted to just thank you on that anyway. And um, but but love your uh, passion, and we can see with your drawings and, and everything else, we can see that DJ connection. That's wonderful. So thank you very much, Martin. It's been really good having you uh, today. And. Um...